Open it up to Ephesians chapter 6. We're continuing on in our armament uh, in which we're going to be equipped against the wiles of the devil. Why don't you stand for the reading of God's word and we'll read and grow together. Uh, we're going to focus on one verse in particular, verse 15, which talks to us about putting on our feet the gospel of peace. Uh, we'll begin in verse 10, but really focus on 15 and we'll study through that when we get there. But Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Heavenly Father, if in any area of our life we've grown lukewarm, forgive us, Lord, and stir us again. Lord, if we've grown weary, strengthen us. Fill us to overflowing. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Church, you can have a seat. As we go through this armament together, last time was putting on the breastplate of righteousness and making a clear distinction that is not talking about the righteousness that comes through Christ for salvation, that is unique in and of itself, but it's acts of doing what is right according to the will of God, that we're to be engaged and living out the things that we believe. And so putting on the righteousness or righteous acts of the saints and then girded or all held together with the belt of truth, never compromising, apologizing for, or watering down the revealed truth of God. And as we do that, we commit to truth. We act out our beliefs in righteousness. We're told here to shod your feet with the gospel of peace. Now you can take this single statement and we will today and look at it from two different perspectives. There's the description and then there's the commission. So we're gonna look at the description of this verse and then the commission that comes from this verse. But as we're learning, or this description part, you'll notice it's not just the gospel, it's the gospel of peace. If you've ever done a word search throughout the Bible, if you've never done a word study, I'd encourage you to do it. Take a little bit of time, it's fascinating to do. You can do it on blueletterbible.org, it's a good website, uh, biblegateway.com maybe. And either of these, you pick your translation that you're most familiar with and you put into the search whatever word it is. It could be hope, it could be salvation, it could be sin, it could be repentance, it could be, in our case, peace. And you hit search and it will pull up every single Bible verse from Genesis to Revelation that references that word. Now know this, love, loved, loving, loves are all different words. So sometimes you gotta look up the variations. But you look up peace and you will be overwhelmed with how stacked and full the Bible is with this very topic of peace. You get to Ephesians and you find out it's been woven through this book the whole time. Just like any decent father desires for his kids to have a calm mind and a strong heart, to have the peace in their hearts and their minds, our Heavenly Father desires the same things. That fear and worry and anxiousness wouldn't be what drives our decisions or relationships. And so just like you and I desire peace for our kids, our Heavenly Father desires the same thing for you and I. If you have your Bibles open, it was chapter one of Ephesians that were introduced to it very quickly. Verse two says, grace to you and 
peace, a strong and calm heart and mind. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 brings it up again as this thread is woven through the book. Chapter 2, verse 14, referencing the Lord himself, he says, and he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. No longer Jew or Gentile, but united together in Christ. And then just a statement or two later in chapter two, but verse 17, and he came and preached peace that our hearts and our minds would be calm and stable to you who were afar off and to those who were near. It's incredible. In this description of verse 15 alone, you could kind of word it as such. Description, the gospel is to be tethered to you at all times. To be tethered to the gospel. Shod your feet, it says, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, we don't talk like this anymore, but to shod is much, much more than just put on your flip-flops. You can think through any Roman-esque era picture or movie you've seen. And they have these leather straps that wrap around the ankle and up towards the calves. They are bound into these cleats. The soles of the sandals or shoes, whatever you want to call them, would have been extremely thick leather with hollow point nails fixed inside that would give them incredible traction and advantage over the enemy. And the description and understanding given to the church is that we are to be fixed, tethered to the gospel of peace. The whole statement, right, is built off of being able to stand when no one else is, being able to stand against the wiles of the devil and the trickery of the enemy and to withstand in the evil day. And so the church, yes, does what's right according to the Lord. We have the truth and don't compromise it. But my, oh my, are we to be planted, tethered to the gospel of peace. Now, gospel itself is actually a pretty generic word. It, it feels very Christian, very Bible-esque, but it's a word that just has kind of a generic meaning in general. It can be applied to lots of different things. Gospel was a way of describing glad or good tidings, good news. If you get a raise or a promotion at work and you come home and you're like, family, guess what? I got the promotion. That is a gospel. It's a good news. If someone works up the courage and gets down on a knee and asks someone to marry them and she says, yes. Oh, do you have some good news? Look, you and I have the best news in the whole world. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. The promises of the Bible declare that guilty, guilty of my sins was on a broad road that led to eternal destruction in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. That was my guaranteed destination. But God oh, so loved the world, including this fool that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, including me, would believe in him, I wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life, that my sins, though they be like scarlet, crimson, red, would be washed away and the Lord would see me as pure and clean as the freshly fallen snow. You can't beat that. And it is to be tethered to our soul, always on our mind. You'll probably grow weary of this by the time it finally comes, but this summer, right, is the Olympics. And one of the neatest things about the Olympics, I love opening day and the ceremonies, not because of the music and everything, but if you watch the athletes, there are countries showing up that know they will go home having not won a medal. They know. They know that there's other countries who have been coming for generations and taking home medals hand over fist. But they don't walk in all mopey, clothed in their country's colors, carrying their flag. They come in so proud and excited and that flaming arrow hits the torch and away we go. 
You and I, look, I love red, white, and blue, but the banner we fly is of eternity. It's our citizenship's in heaven. The good news, do you know? Do those around you know? Look, land of the free and home of the brave. I love it. I pray you and I both would be willing to give our lives for it. But as a believer, we have an even better mantra. To be a Christ follower, dead in my trespasses and sins, but made alive through Christ. Or if you are a Christian, truly forgiven and made new through what Christ did do, however you want to word it. But you can't beat it. But it's not just the gospel. Look at verse 15. It's not just the gospel. It's the gospel of peace. Now, peace, kind of like a multi-layered cake, has three different portions of richness, every one of them good. So we're going to come back every couple of minutes and look at the next layer because every one are worth biting into. But peace, the first layer, it means to be exempt from the rage and havoc of war. Think of what it must have been like to be Noah. You're on the ark with your wife, your three sons and their wives. And all of a sudden, the fountains of the deep break open and the windows of heaven are torn in two. And all around you is death and chaos. And all you have to do is float. Totally immune from everything going on outside of it. And you and I live in a crazy, tumultuous world that is absolutely accelerating in chaos. But in Christ, it's okay. Our hearts and our minds fixed on the gospel of peace that in the end, all things work together for good to those who know and love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Now, peer pressure. I used to think peer pressure was like something kids dealt with. Ah, and then you get older and you're like, why am I still dealing with kid issues? They're life issues. They're the issues of humanity and the weakness of our own flesh. You and I can get more jealous than a teenage couple. We can covet very well and become greedy. Adults throw temper tantrums as well as any toddler. And peer pressure sets in regardless of your age if you're not careful. Remember, we're talking about avoiding and combating the trickery of the devil. That's the whole application here. And so one of the ways he does it is to diminish the peace that you have in God and create a fearfulness of people's opinion of you. And you are in the hands of the devil in that moment. But we can't succumb to peer pressure, right? The Lord speaking to people, he says, hey, you should not fear those who can kill your body. You know, um, why not? <laughs> You know, even back then, they didn't have lethal injection or a firing squad. Death at the hands of someone back then would have been brutal and painful. And Jesus says, that's not who you're to be influenced by. In Luke chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, Jesus speaking says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do to you. Right? Well, yeah, because I'm dead. And then he elaborates, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. If you're going to be influenced by somebody, make sure it's the right somebody. This life is so short and temporary. Now, I remember, I don't know your testimony. I'd love to hear it. And you maybe don't know all of mine. Someday, maybe you'll get it. But a portion of mine, I remember life before knowing the Lord. You guys? And before knowing the Lord was hopelessness, no peace, no assurance, just this dark, hollow void. But what's incredible is that even if you come to the point of wishing you were no longer alive, when Christ moves in, something completely different happens. Now, myself, I've shared this with you. I don't like getting older in the body. 
it's not working the same. Like, come on. Soon my sons will think they're stronger than me. And uh, who knows? But here's the fun thing. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is truly being renewed day by day. That the older you get, like how many of you guys have been saved five years or more? 10 years or more? 20 years or more? 30? 40 years or more? Oh yeah, I'm hanging out with you. Because this is what the Bible says. Yes, our outward person's getting a little tired, but the inward's being renewed every day. So you know the Lord better. You know about his joy and peace and patience and power and revelation and God. You know all about stuff I have yet to learn. So look, yeah, growing older in the Lord, you get to collect wisdom the whole time. Sign me up. And it's also the further from my sin nature I get. If you had a dog or a pet of some kind that passed away 10 or 15 years ago, you remember having it. And you remember that it had a strange aroma, but you can't, you can't, man, what was that smell? I can't quite recall the actual smell. Or the, the way that their, their fur actually, fit. I remember liking to pet them, but how did that feel exactly? It becomes a very distant, difficult memory to recall. And I know for sure when Christ found me, it was in deep, dark despair. I remember that, but I can't, I look back like, but I don't remember the, the actual hollow feeling of it. There are others who being saved from drugs and alcohol go like, man, I remember being entrapped by it, but looking back, I can't remember why it seemed so alluring. Others so desperate for relationship that they were constantly in pursuit and, and getting saved out of that. Look back like, man, what, what was it? How did I think a person was going to fix something spiritual? And so as we move forward in the Lord, collecting wisdom and growing in the grace and the knowledge, we grow also in peace the peace of God, exempt from the rage and havoc of war. The world needs to know. The second thing, the layer on the cake of peace, this is a long one, but it's very beautifully put. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. It's so knowing in the end, I'm good. Did you wake up rich today? Praise the Lord. Did you wake up poor? Praise the Lord. Did you wake up healthy? Praise the Lord. Did you wake up unhealthy? Praise the Lord. Why? He's got the whole thing under control. All of it. Now, I, I pray as you guys are getting to know the Bible more and more every day and that it's part of your daily life, that part of it, though we, we love the whole thing, part of it you have a relationship with. You have a story about. I remember when I first got saved, boy, man, I was a raging, angry person. And the first verse I ever memorized was in James chapter one. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not allow for the righteousness of God. Like, that was your first verse? <laughs> yeah. And my, how alive it was. And because of my testimony, I remember laying on my living room floor, I think I was about 21, turning 22, and for the first time I read Matthew chapter 11. And Jesus' invitation, come to me all those who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Look, you guys can all read it, but that verse is mine. That is mine. I will share. <laughs> But that verse, oh my. And we all have our own. One I pray you become more and more familiar with. This last year has been such a joy to have a relationship. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. We'll pause in the middle, but it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You like, we're just like clay pots. We'll be broken and done one day. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Anyone ever been hard pressed? 
And I mean in the vice of life and it's squeezing, you're like, I'm gonna die. I know it feels that way, but guess what? You're not gonna die. You're fine. I don't feel fine. Oh, that's okay. Feelings are liars. What God wants you to have in the midst of that is peace. Hard pressed, but not crushed. You can't be. And then it goes on, and this has been so neat. Recently, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Think of this, and this ties into our passage here perfectly, the peace of God. Perplexed, it means to be in a state of confusion or not knowing where you are. And I don't know about you, but us guys, us men, right? We don't get lost. It just doesn't happen. Now, sometimes we take the long way. That's true. But we don't get lost. But when you're taking the long way, you don't turn back to your kids like, panic, guys, I don't know where we are. <laughs> that's, that's not how that works. You just kind of go along and they're in the back coloring in their books or ride, do whatever it is the kids are doing because they just, dad's got it. And sometimes circumstances in life, no doubt the fog will set in. You're like, I'm lost. I don't know which way is up. I don't know where to go. I don't know the answer to this situation. And that's true for you, but it's not true for the Lord. And your heavenly father in the seats got it. So yes, perplexed, but that's okay. Peace in the confusion. It's incredible. Now, I'm convinced, I used to think the opposite, but I'm convinced I could get a job at an IT company. Um, I could fix nine out of 10 problems in pretty much anyone's IT world. I can also create nine out of 10 of your problems in the IT world, so <laughs> let me just assure you. And what I learned early, early, early on, while myself and technology are not compatible, I'd call up the IT guys and be like, hey, I broke it again. Yeah. They're like, well, try restarting your computer. Oh, okay, restart, and everything was fine. And then I'd call a few weeks later because I broke it again, and they're like, David, yeah, did you try restarting your computer? Oh, yeah, oh, I fixed it. Oh. And then I'd call a few weeks later, and then I started, oh, wait, hold on. Okay, I, I, I did it on my own this time. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, you just got to reset. And for you and I, look, Satan's going to try and discourage, distract, persuade, make you anxious, whatever it is, the tactics and the wiles of the devil. But we have to get good as God's people of resetting our mind to Christ. Whatever may be going on, your family's getting kind of squirrely and intense. Income's not as secure as you thought it would be by now. Your health is in question, whatever it is, and you feel the flustered, you feel the frustrated. Oh, 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 hold on. Don't run away, just step aside. Reset your mind on Christ and he will give you the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The church is to tether itself to the gospel of peace, that it's always with us all the time. It's what Jesus even sent people away with or introduced them to. The woman with this 12 year long physical ailment, putting herself in a very socially awkward and almost taboo scenario, comes to Jesus, grabs his him, is made whole. And what does he say to her? Mark 5, verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Isn't that where we always stop? Why do we stop there? Go in peace. What's going to happen tomorrow? What are people going to think of me? Is it going to come back? What? Daughter, go in peace. May your heart and your mind be settled. Or the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus with a beautiful fragrance and wiped away tears with her own hair and everyone in the room giving her a hard time, Simon being corrected by the Lord himself in Luke 7, verse 50. Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Tethered, fixed, planted in the gospel of peace. That when you're with the Lord, you're going to be fine. 
We think of Resurrection Sunday, right? Easter, it's coming. I think it's only eight weeks away, so panic on that. But we, we rejoice and celebrate. But we know the whole story. The disciples had to live it out. And you read about their experience just a moment or two earlier. The one whom they committed their lives to was nailed to the cross, thrown into a tomb. And then the rumor circulating through Jerusalem is that they went in and took the body and then sowed a lie amongst the com community that he had risen. And so they're behind closed doors for fear of the rumor and the culture they were living in. And then Jesus just shows up. And trust me, you and I would react just like they did. Unsure of everything. And in John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus came and stood in their midst. And what did he say? He said to them, peace be with you. Hey guys, I know the city's in an uproar. I know all these false things being said and the rumors. I know you can't even figure out how you're looking at me right now. Just, but hey, peace. It's going to be okay. The third thing peace means is to be made one with or to reconcile. I used to know two couples that had this story. I now know three, someone in the last service. So neat. To be made one with or to reconcile back to unity. And I don't ever want this story. Uh, I, don't, I don't want any of you to have this story, but if it's yours, it's a beautiful one. Those who met each other, fell in love, got married, only to wind up divorced, then meet the Lord and get remarried again. What? Oh, yeah. Now, look, <laughs> you... No more of those stories, okay? Just love each other now and say that way. But how God can take two broken people, make them whole and put them back together again. Oh my goodness. What can he not do? And we have been reconciled to him, made one with, made right. There's no more separation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. You're good with the Lord. You're good. He's not up there disappointed, mad, shaming. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There's conviction and correction, but no condemnation. But then he says, look at, as I have reconciled you to me and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, you're to be busy doing what other people were doing to you, introducing people to the gospel, the good news, the best news in the whole world. It's what we stand on. Now, pause. Remember, this whole verse here, it's just one verse, but it's in light of the fact that Satan has tricks and the enemy has traps. When you remove peace, guess what grows in its place? All kinds of not peace, whether it's anxiousness, it's depression, it's worry, it's fear, it's bitterness, it's resentment. All kinds of ungodly things will grow in the absence of peace. And so Satan's just trying to move it out of the way, just distract you or discourage you with almost anything he can. It's fascinating. The idea years and years ago was that the more impoverished a country was, the more anxiety they would have experienced. And logically, that makes sense. But a study was done in 2017 and published in a medical journal by a psychiatrist. And they found out those living in higher income countries experienced three times more the anxiousness. Why is that? Because money and stuff cannot fix your soul. Amazon cannot deliver enough boxes to fill the void. Your phone will never wash away the struggles of your mind. Never going to happen. Then to confirm it, just a year later, 2018, Barnes & Noble put out their report. They saw a 25% increase when it came to the sale of books dealing with anxiety. And more recently, they've discovered two-thirds of Americans 
are anxious about the future health and safety of themselves or their family. Church, the world is overdue for some good news. Not just that their shirt's nice or you like their haircut, but that there is an eternal, immovable peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That there is salvation from their sins and transgressions. A believer, right, made fearful or nervous or distracted is going to be powerless against the wiles of the devil. Now, this is funny. I, I think I was a pretty good kid. You can ask my mom. I don't know. But I remember watching this in a movie, and I don't know if she remembers this. I don't know if it worked or not, but I tried it. I remember you, you roll the window down. Remember you had to do this, roll the window down? <laughs> you roll the window down, and then you take your hand and put it outside and start hitting the car like something's wrong. Da, 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 da. And the driver, the whole goal is for the driver to think the car's breaking down and go, oh no, and pull over. Not sure I pulled it off. But Satan comes in and goes like, oh no, something's wrong with your life. Da, 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 da. And go, oh no, something's wrong with my life. No, there's not. If you're in Christ, it's fine, perplexed, but not in despair, gifted the peace of God that surpasses all understanding if we fix our mind on him. I've had people even describe themselves to me as like, oh, I'm one of those people who has paralysis by analysis. I'm like what? Yeah, I, I think so much I get stuck and don't know what to do. Well, why don't you just trust the Lord and do something? Now, I'm not saying be foolish and throw all caution to the wind, but your God's so small, he can't fix a mistake if you make one. You know, if you get off on the wrong exit, you can just get on again. Or if you take the wrong turn, there's detours. It's okay. God's got it. Has anyone ever done something and you felt like you just destroyed your entire life? That's it. Oh, come on, last service. Okay, I, I was like, there's no way. Here you are, totally fine. Everything's going to be okay. God's way bigger than our missteps and mistakes. I love this, man. Think about the power of God. Peace and power together. God is so wonderful. We're gonna jump to chapter 16 of Romans, verse 20. It says, and the God of peace, it's his, he gives it, will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And that's how you end a letter. Oh, next time someone calls in a panic, don't worry. The Lord's about to crush Satan's head. It's fine. You're like, okay, I could do this. It's almost over. Whether he comes back or you go see him, it's almost over. You read verses like this one. How, let me ask you, how nervous is the Lord today? Well, zero. How fearful has he ever been? Zero. So how nervous and fearful should a child of God be? Zero. John 14, verse 27, Jesus says, peace. The comfort and stability be upon your heart and your mind. Peace I leave with you. And not like the table scraps or the leftovers. My peace. The peace that will take you eternity to figure out. So grand you can't even comprehend it. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. It's not, not a sales pitch. Let your heart not be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Now look, don't dilute what we studied together last time. Don't. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do the right thing as long as you're on this planet but don't worry about it, right? Lord willing, by the end of this year, we will have a new commander in chief. Right? Well, hang tight though. <laughs> like, will we? <laughs> I don't know. But I know this, four years from then, it'll be someone else. Then what? Well, we'll just panic all over again. Panic and worry and panic and worry and panic and worry and die. Like, oh, that's a good life. Look, no matter what, I'm telling you, you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do the right thing. Do not forfeit truth, but don't worry about the outcome. You tether to your soul the gospel of peace. It cannot be in who has earthly power or riches, 
It's to be in Christ, who has eternal power and riches. Now, we're going to shift. That's the description of this verse, but what about the commission that comes out of it? I love what Warren Wearsby said. He said, the most victorious Christian is a witnessing Christian. And so, church, keep your buckle on. We're going quick on this one, but it's wildly important. The commission, there's one word in here. It's not shod your feet with the gospel of peace. It's shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Very important observation worth making. Because to prepare something, it means the act of making it ready. If any of you enjoy Thanksgiving dinner, it's because someone took the time to prepare and make ready all day long. And so if you want to, like Warren Wearsby said, you want to war against the tactics of the enemy and not be overcome by all of his trickery, then you need to be actively engaged in the preparation of the gospel of peace, gearing up for the big game, so to say. Now, two th I've done this twice. I don't think more. You can ask my wife. She'll have to double check. But I've done this twice. Uh, I remember when our kids were very, very young. We were going to go camping. And, you know, dad's job is load all the stuff. And then dads also have a, a time that everyone's supposed to leave. Even if you're miserable, you're going to be in the car on time. And so they were young. We had the, I got the tent in. I got the sleeping bags in. I got the propane stove and the firewood and the luggage. And they were young, so all the toys were loaded up. And we get in the car. And I think we're only like 10 minutes behind schedule. This is a victory. Like, yeah, I'm killing it. And we drive all the way down, get out in the sunset. I'm setting up the tent, rolling out sleeping bags, set up the stove. I mean, this was father of the year. Where's my bag? I left all my clothes sitting next to the front door of our house. How does that work? Another time, kind of like Wahoo's down the road here, there was a fun zone we were taking the kids to. And I, look, don't try and figure me out. I can't even figure me out, so best of luck to you. We get there, jump out of the car, and I have no shoes. <laughs> what? True story. Sorry, kids. Back in the car. We got to get dad's shoes. We'll be back in an hour. What on earth? <laughs> but I wonder how often God's people leave home without the gospel tethered to their soul. We can't. The moment we do, the moment we leave unprepared, the enemy has full access to meddle with your mind and mess others up with your life. If you're not this person, you do at least have a couple of these friends, right? You guys have friends that are into firearms and, you know, personal protective gear. There's something called the EDC or everyday carry. And boy, people that have their EDC, their everyday carry, they are proud of it. This is my knife I take when I'm going this place. And this is my knife I take in that place. And this is my concealed carry, my open carry. And I mean, they're like all about it. I got a couple of friends and I just, I love these guys. Hang out with them anytime. You're going to be very safe. <laughs> but they got their EDC, their everyday carry. For you and I, our everyday carry is to be the gospel of peace and to be prepared for it. Never leave home without it tethered to your soul. Now, here's what's fun. Satan, let, can we just blast Satan real quick here and at least get rid of one of his tactics? He, I bet you, tell me if I'm wrong, has convinced you more than once not to say God bless you or Jesus loves you or to pray for you, even though there's a Holy Spirit conviction in your soul to reach out to somebody you didn't because you were unsure as to how it would go and you were afraid of what questions they might ask. Right? You guys, the lost world are not biblical theologians. They have no big questions for you. <laughs> what are they going to ask? Can you explain propitiation? Like, what are they going to ask? And yet we're convinced we can't answer their questions even though they don't have questions to ask. If all it was was, hey man, can I pray for you real quick? Hey, God bless you. 
just after the last service, a lady showed me, she, I was on the airplane and the Lord was saying, give this. she keeps these gospel tracks, the Roman road with her. And she was like, I was supposed to, there's a 20 year old girl and this lady's older and I'm supposed to give her this track. I was like, I'll do it right when we get off the plane and the Lord's convicted me, do it now. And uh, so she gives her this track. She's like, you should read this sometime, you know, it's, it's really cool. And, and then she's like, oh, I did it. The girl immediately drops the table, opens it up, reads the whole track. They start having an hour long conversation about the Lord and salvation. On the airplane, the girl gives her life to the Lord and there's this picture of them together like, ah, like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's the little things, but don't leave home without it. The world's not a theologian. They usually don't even know. Can you prove the existence of God? One in every hundred might ask you that. And you go, no, but I know he's real. You start sharing your testimony with people. Look, people can't argue with your story. What are they tell you? Your life's not real. And if your story is really God's story, case closed. Peter says in chapter three, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Every day carry. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Can you, can you prove the infallibility of the Bible? Um, maybe someday, but that doesn't change the fact that it's true. To be a light, look, you know, it doesn't take much light to influence a room. This happens every Sunday morning. I get out my phone, one little light lights up my whole closet and can find what I need to wear. Now, maybe you think you're, you're kind of not a really smart Christian. Well, that's okay. Even if you are the dimmest light in the church, you're bright enough to shine in the darkness. Truly. I know guys who in the last year have used their, they own their own businesses. So once a month, they pray with their employees. Hey guys, we're starting, they're starting Monday with a prayer meeting. Well, I don't own a business. Then you're off the hook. <laughs> but God's called you to do something. I know a young man, a high school kid, he works at Ridley's and when he takes groceries out with people who ask for help, he asks them, hey, can I pray for you? And there are people who have welled up in tears because God has reminded them through a high school kid that he knows them. I'm sure high school kids are not outshining us, right? <laughs> got a call, this is fun. Got a call a couple months ago, two months ago. One of my favorite couples, they're like, Pastor David, we're in Panama. I'm like, what are you doing in Panama? That doesn't matter. We're at this restaurant. And then I hear his wife, it's a bar. I'm like, it's not a bar. Well, it's kind of a bar, but we're at a table. It's like, it's, <laughs> hey, it's fine. Every, it's fine, okay? I just got to tell you, we just left or we're getting ready to leave. And this wa the waitress that was here in Panama uh, looked kind of bummed. And my wife asked if she was okay. And she said, no, her father just passed away and they didn't know what to do with the service. She ended up sitting down at our table for two hours. And we talked to her and told her about the Lord and, and how awesome God is. And then we took her phone and downloaded the Bible app onto her phone for her. And, and it was awesome. Praise the Lord. You're like, well, I'm not in Panama. Then you're off the hook. But there's a waitress in Panama who has the Bible on her phone because the people asked her how she was. Where are you going to be in an hour? What are you doing on Monday? You are a bearer of the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the savior of our soul. And so we're going to end with these two things. But look, a commissioning is given to us here the active preparation or making ready of the gospel. And so I wanna challenge you guys to do two things together. One is as a family, if, if you live alone, call a friend, knock on a neighbor's door, whatever. But when's the last time you've shared your God story, your testimony with somebody? Share it, it's fun at a table. You'll sound like a fool, mumbling, bumbling all over your words, that's okay. Your family will laugh at you and then tomorrow you'll move on. It's the best place to practice. If you don't like practicing with your family, practice with your dog or your cat. But get used to sharing your testimony. It's powerful. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. says, and they overcame him. It's a direct reference to Satan, the accuser of the brethren. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the cross, and by the word of their testimony. Can you share your story with people? The answer is yes. Will you? Now, the last thing. It's very possible that many of us don't know how to share our faith. 
that's okay. But we're going to commit the next four weeks to memorizing one Bible verse a week together. And by the end, you will know a very basic, simple way of sharing the gospel. Okay? You guys, you good? Okay. This is easy. So if you don't do it, we got problems. Uh, go ahead and throw this up there. It's called the four R's, right? We're going to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so the four R's, realize, recognize, repent, receive. Okay, try it on real quick. Say realize, recognize, recognize repent, 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 receive. receive. Okay, cool. Uh, in the end, about two more slides, there'll be some verses for you. But the first one comes with a statement, realize you are a sinner. Okay, look at someone and say, you're a sinner. Uh -huh. now, now, some of you had way too much fun with that. But remember, someone just said it to you too, so you're even. Realize you're a sinner. Recognize Christ died for you. Repent from your sins. Receive salvation by faith. Very simple. I mean, there cannot be a simpler way. There's something awesome called the Romans Road. There's the Gospel Hand. There's all kinds of ways to get involved in this stuff. But if you're going to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, we'll start with just this week. Realize you are a sinner. The Bible verses, this is the, the screen you probably want to take a picture of. Romans 3.23. It cannot get easier than this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the whole verse. And it's the beginning of the gospel. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Realize you're a sinner. We'll work on the next one next week. Just take a minute or two together. But we have got to be, look, the only power we have is over this little fellowship. And so we ought to be people that don't just believe the word, but live it out. Jesus said in Mark 6, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. So yes, you can even practice on your dog. Today, if somehow you're sitting in here and you're like, man, some of these verses are, are kind of freaking me out. They're not freaking me out. We're good. We have the peace of God that you're afraid of eternity? Yeah. Oh, man. I remember that a long time ago. Can't feel it anymore, but I remember it. Are you ready? Bible says if you're willing to confess, you want to, you're willing to associate with Jesus from this point forward, confess him as Lord. He gets to call the shots. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The moment you're willing to do those two things, confess him as Lord and put your faith and trust in what he did on the cross and the power of the resurrection, you are forgiven and given new life. Why not today? You'll have the best news in the whole world to share. Church, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I wonder how many times I've been tricked by the enemy, not knowing that to be silent was to give him access to my life, to not be obedient to your convictions, was to step into enemy-occupied territory. God, we ask that you would fan a new flame in our hearts for the lost. Lord, a joyful commitment, not bound out of obligation because we have to, a joyful commitment to get a little bit better week by week in sharing the good news with a dying world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.